Today we're going to be learning Megillah Daf Lamed Aleph. We are at the very end of our Masechet. Mezrat um, Hashem, we will finish together on Sunday, so you'll have to wait a few days. Um, and those who want can join. There's a Hebrew Seum tomorrow night, and the English Seum, as usual, will be on Sunday. Um, we're looking forward to seeing you there. We have Rabbi Nikki LaRosen with us, and we have a um, very interesting guest from... Uh, from Pelech, Beit Sefer Pelech in, in Tel Aviv, who Pelech in general, they did a whole, um, uh, they got a, a lot of girls from their school to learn Masechet Megillah together. So one of their students is going to share some words about her experience and what she learned. Okay, so we're looking forward to that. And with that, we will get started. Okay, today's dedication. Um, Today's daf is dedicated by Linda Friedman, Sheila Strolowitz, Gwen Lerner, her nine grandchildren, and 28 grand, great-grandchildren for Thelma Pultman's 95th birthday. We wish you the happiest of birthdays and many more to come. All our love from your family. You have created a beautiful legacy. Mazal tov. Okay, we're going to go back to the Mishnah. Okay, I'm going to make some order here. Okay, what we have in the Mishnah, we'll start from where we started yesterday. We're going to have a list in the Mishnah of what we read on what day. And then we're going to see, as we noticed already yesterday, that some of these don't exactly match what we do. The best thing really I recommend is if you can get a machzer or a sitter that has a list of all the things we read on all the different days, it would be very useful for this class. Um, I'm going to try to make some order for you and, and compare and talk about what we do, what we don't do. I want to start by actually reading Tosfot, okay? Tosfot on the page of yesterday's page basically says... On the line where it says that on all the other days of the holiday of Sukkot, we read the sacrifice for that day. So Tosfot says, Nowadays, on every holiday, what do we do? We take out another Sefer Torah. And when it comes to Maftir, after we've read whatever section of that day, when it comes to Maftir, we're talking about on Yom Tov, okay? Not on a weekday, but on Yom Tov, we read the maftir of the sacrifice of that day. So, we don't see any reference to this in the Gemara at all. He says, where can I find that? I found it in the Seder of Amram Gaon. That was a book written by Rav Amram Gaon, okay, one of the Gaonim. That's from the time period of 800 to 1000. They, you know, he, that's the time period of the Gaonim. I'm telling general time period because what we're going to talk about is that a lot of these things developed over time. Some of these customs, by the way, are found in a book called Masechet Sofrim, which is a book that is generally assumed to be also from the Gaonic time period, although some people think it's earlier, um, where it has a lot about davening and laning and all of that. And in the Sidurim of the Gaonim, Seder of Amagon is one of the earliest Sidurim that exists. Okay, We don't really have Sidurim from before that. Um, and he says, he tries to say, we can find a little reference, allusion to it in the Gemara, but really, these things don't appear in the Gemara. And what we're going to see is, you know, like yesterday, for instance, we said on Rosh Hashanah, we read this. It's not really what we read on Rosh Hashanah. So why is that exactly? So first of all, some of them we'll see in the Gemara later, because what we're going to see today is the Mishnah. Then we're going to have a Brita that seems to have some similar things to the Mishnah, some things that are different from the Mishnah. Also, the Bright is going to talk about Haftorahs, which were not mentioned at all, right? What parts from the prophets we read, which were not mentioned at all in the Mishnah. And we're going to have this very long Bright that's going to be interrupted every, every line or two by the Amoraim, who are going to chime in with either things they don't understand in the Bright, or that they want to explain, or comments like, oh, well, nowadays we don't do this, okay? And then you're going to see differences. Now, not all their differences are going to match what we do either, because obviously this was something that we've talked about this before. When you have prayer in the Gemara, it's not exactly viewed as a halachic thing. This is based on custom. In those days, remember, we learned with Machliot Zichronot and Shofarot, where it says how many psukim you have to add, and people would add their own verses. There were just rules about which verses could be added. Likewise, when it comes to the laning or the Haftorah, it's general guidelines. You'll see here, they don't exactly tell you from this verse to this verse. They just talk about a section. And the commentaries tell you, oh, it means this verse to that verse. And even within the commentaries, there's different opinions about it. By the way, I brought on the sheet today the where, when they make a reference to something, which verses are they referring to? But I just want you to know, even though I've written them in, it doesn't mean that is the only answer for exactly where this is. Some people have, you know, the starting point and ending point a little bit different. 
That's why if you are in shul and you notice haftoras, sometimes it says Svardim start here or end here, and Ashkenazim start here and end there. There's often differences of opinion. Sometimes they even have an entirely different haftorah. So this is very custom based rather than halachic, right? There's many things in the Gemara that are very clearly halachic, and this is definitely not one of them. So let's start again and let's go through a little bit more carefully than we did yesterday. So on Pesach, we read Parashat Emor, right? And all the things about the different holidays. Now, just to point out, we do not read this on the first day of Pesach, okay? It's read on Yom Tov Sheni Shogaliot, the second day of Yantif in Chutz Laaretz, in, in the exile, anywhere outside of Israel. And we read actually on the first day, Mishchu Ukhu, which we're going to see referenced later in the Brayta, which is from Shemot Yebet, which is in the story of Pesach, when they were getting out and take the, they take the seh, slaughter the seh, put it on the doorpost, that whole story, which is not mentioned here at all. Okay, so again, already... At the first thing, we already have a difference. Ba'atzeret, Shiva Shavuot. We also don't read this, by the way, right? On, on Shavuot, what do we read? We read from Ma'amad Har Sinai, right? When we got the Torah. That's what happened on Shavuot. So this is a section in Sefer Dvarim, which will later be referred to also as Kola Bechol, because it talks about Bechor, then it talks about holidays, and then it gets to the Shiva Shavuot. Now here they're mentioning the Shiva Shavuot, because that's the seven weeks leading to to Shavuot, and that's why it says we read this on Shavuot, because of that Pasuk. Right? It really means the whole section, which actually we read on the second day of Shavuot in, uh, in the, you know, outside of Israel. Birosh Hashanah, B'chodesh HaShvi'i Be'echad L'chodesh, which is the section in Vayikra Kaf Gimel, which we just mentioned that we were supposed to read on Pesach, which we read on the second day of Pesach, not the first, like it says. And it's just that section on about Rosh Hashanah that's mentioned there. Which again, we do not read on Rosh Hashanah. Okay, we'll talk about, right? We said yesterday, I'm just getting confused a little bit. We said, right, we read the Hashem Pakad at Sarah, that Sarah is, you know, remembered and has a child, and the Akedat Yitzchak. Okay, this is the first one that we actually do mention in this Mishnah, which is we read the Avodat Yom Kippurim. Um, what the Kohen Gadol did on Yom Kippur. Biyom Tavarishon Shachal, Korim Beparashat Amoadot Shabitorat Kohanim. This, by the way, is interesting. It's read on the first day of Sukkot, like it says, which is, again, the whole section in Emor, starting from Parakaf Bet, moving into Parakaf Gimel, the list of all the holidays. And it's read also on day number two in Yom Tov Sheni Shogaliyot. On the second day, they read the same thing as the first day, which is rare that we do that. Um, on all the other days, we read the unique sacrifice of that day. Again, we've talked about this before. There's a difference in Chutz Laaretz and in Israel, what you read, whether you repeat all the same, how you do the repetition, because you need four aliyot, and it's really each one is only one. And when you're in Galut, you need to read two days, because maybe it's this day, maybe it's that day. Anyway, this whole thing about how you read them. Um, Okay, you read about the Nisim because they brought these sacrifices for the Chanukah and Mizbeach, these gifts. Right? There is no Chanukah in the Torah, so we have to find some reference to it. We're going to have the same problem when we get the Haftorah. There's no Chanukah in the Haftorahs either. So what are you going to read? Bipurim vayavo Amalek, because that's all about Amalek. Birashei Chodashim uvrashei Chodashichem, that's the sacrifices you bring on Rosh Chodesh. Bima'amadot bima'aseh bereshit, right? In the Ma'amadot you read about the days of creation. B'ta'niyot, brachot uklalot. On the Taniyot, you read the blessings and the curses in the Torah, right? There's these sections. We'll get back to this later, both in Vayikra, at the end of Vayikra. According to Rashi, that's the one you read on the ta- on the fast days, um, and which actually we don't read on fast days, but that's what they say here. And there's also ones at the end of Sefer Dvarim, in Parshat Kitavo, there's klalot. We'll talk about these all later. When you read the klalot, you don't stop in the middle. This is very famously well known, right? It's always when a bar mitzvah boy gets up and starts reading, right? Uh, it, it's And they, they have this really long aliyah. You feel bad for them because, you know, it's the first time reading and they have a really, really long aliyah. We'll even get to this a story about this later in the Gemara, not about a bar mitzvah boy. But um, but anyway, the um, or, a bar, or a bar mitzvah girl is reading from the Torah. Um, so, aim of Sikim Klalot, you have to read that entire Aliyah straight. Okay? You can't stop. We'll talk about that later. So, one reads the entire section. 
Okay, so on Mondays, Thursdays, and Shabbos Mencha, Korin Kesidran, you read in order, like what you're up to. Ve'ein olin lahem mina cheshbon. Okay, what does this mean? This means it doesn't, okay, we're going to see. Now, it's very obvious that on Mondays, Thursdays, or Shabbos Mencha, if you've been in shul, you know that they read the first aliyah of the next week's Parsha. Okay, that's what's read. Now, again, you, you never really thought about this only because you're used to the way it is, right? Then comes Shabbat. It's true you've already read three times the first Aliyah, but of course you start with the beginning of the Parsha on Shabbat. So this is telling you, you it doesn't count, meaning if you already did the first Aliyah a week, you might have thought when it comes to Shabbat, well, you don't have to read the first Aliyah. We already read it three times. So no, they're telling you, you have to read it anyway. That doesn't count for you. We're going to see a very different opinion in the mission in the Gemara later. We're going to end with this today about an opinion that has a totally different way of viewing this reading on Monday, Thursday, and Shabbat Mincha, which I think you're going to find surprising. Shene'ema. Now, this seems to be referring to, in general, the Mishnah, which is, Vayidabel Moshe et Moadei Hashem Bnei Yisrael. This is in that section in Emor that we were referring to. Mitzvatan shu korin kol echa bizmano. It's a mitzvah that everybody read, and as the mitzvah is, that we should read, um, that everybody should, we should say each holiday has its own special reading. Okay, that's what we're learning from this pasuk, that everything is read in its proper time, meaning when we're talking about this holiday, so we're going to talk about that, we're going to read it. When we're talking about this holiday, we're going to read about that. That teaches us that we need a special Torah reading for each one, and that we don't do the regular Torah reading that you would have thought. Okay, so now we finish the Mishnah, and we're going to start with the Brayta. I see some questions that people are asking about, what about Tisha B'Av? And that's the whole thing. There's things missing here from this Mishnah, and that's why we're going to have the Brayta. If you have the sheet in front of you, you're going to see that there's the Mishnah. And that what I did on the sheet was I, I wrote all the, the names of the holidays and the days we're going to talk about, and then what the Mishnah says about it, and then what the Brayta says about it. So if you look, you'll see there's some things toward the end that there's nothing mentioned in the Mishnah about them, but they do appear in this Brayta, or some of them don't even appear in the Brayta, but the Gemara discusses them. And that's why I said here, this is not a complete list. It doesn't talk about Torahs either. It's not necessarily accurate to what we do today. There's a lot of things missing, so we're going to have to fill in a lot of blanks. For that, we bring this Brayta. Tanu Rabbanan. Bepesach korim beparashat mo'adot. So, so far, so good. Same thing. Okay, we don't have a disagreement, even though I already told you that we don't actually do this. So it's interesting. You would have thought maybe the bride would bring a different opinion, but it doesn't. So we read Parshat Amor, right, from Kaf Gimel, uh, Parak Kaf Gimel. By the way, I wrote in the verses here to make it easier for you, okay? So, Vayikra Kaf Bet Kaf Vav to Kaf Gimel Mem Dalid. That's what we read on Pesach. Umaf Tirim Be Pesach Dilgal. This actually we do do. The Torah is from Yehoshua. When they did they got into the land, and then they did Pesach for the first time, it seems, in a while. That's That Pesach we read about makes sense. V'ha'idna. Now, here comes. Now, you have to always know here, this is a good example of when you're reading a Brayta, how to know when the Brayta ends and the Gemara starts. This is going to be a tricky one, because usually we quote a Brayta, and then the Gemara starts commenting. But in this case, we're going to have Brayta comment, Brayta comment, Brayta comment, Brayta comment. Okay, we're going to keep stopping in the middle of the Brayta. So it gets even more confusing and you just have to pay attention usually to the Aramaic or mentioning an Amora's name already is obvious than an Amora is speaking. So Ha'idna, Ha'idna is already Aramaic. Ha'idna means nowadays, okay? So nowadays, the Ika Treyome, that there's two days. So what do we do for the two days? Well, Yom HaKama de Pesach Galgal, Ula Machar be Pesach Yoshiao. Right now they're only talking about the Haftorah. Now it is that we have two days, so the first day we're going to talk about the Pesach that happened in Gilgal when Yoshua came into the land, and then they all did this Brit Milah, and then they did the Pesach, Korban Pesach, because you can't do the Brit Milah without, a, you can't do Pesach without Brit Milah, and people hadn't done it for a while. Anyway, I'm not going to get into the details of that story right now. The next time we have this big Pesach celebration, which seems like also maybe they hadn't done Pesach for a while, was after Yoshua finds this Sefer Torah, and then they all do this big Pesach. So in the time of Yoshua, which again, we're skipping many, many, many years from Yoshua, and then this Pesach in Yoshua's time, which is close to before the destruction of the first temple. Ushar Yemota Pesach. Now, this was missing. We didn't have any mention of this in the, in the Mishnah. So now we're back to the Brayta. And the Brayta is telling us on the other days of Pesach, 
and this will prove my point about just giving you general rules, milaket v'koreh in inosha Pesach, you collect different parts in the Torah, if you remember in the Torah, mentions Pesach many, many times in all different contexts. So it's like a potpourri of, let's take, and if you really look in your Siddur and your Machsur, you'll see that we take all different sections. Okay, we're going to make reference to them in a minute, but, or in two minutes, I should say, because the first one is not exactly what we do. The second one is really what we do. So right now it's very general. So of course, in the bride to write, it's very general. Okay, pick whichever ones you want kind of thing. My he, the, but the Gemara wants to know what really you're supposed to do, right? Already by the time of the Amora, things are becoming much more established. Amara Papa, Mapu Siman. Okay, the Siman is Mapu, Mem Aleph Pevav. I'll already note one important issue here. Okay, that's four. Now, how many intermediary, day, intermediary days of Pesach are there? There's five. Okay, if you're talking about in, in, uh, in Israel. Right? So there's seven days minus the first one and the last one. You really need five Kriyot, and this is only four. So that's a little bit strange. Um, anyway, um, but he mentions four. So what are the four? So this, they don't tell you, okay? You have to look in Rashi, or you can look on my sheet. I brought them. Mishchu Ukhu, which is actually what we read on the first day, okay? That's the part we read on the first day. Not, But here, they have it listed here for the intermediary days. Shmot, it's Shmot Yubek Kafalaf Tanun Aleph. The next one is, right, so that's where they took the se and they put it up on the doorpost to save the, the Jews. Im kesef telavet ami, this is from Shmot Kaf Bet in Parshat Mishpatim, Kaf Dalet to Kaf Gimel Yutet. And this is about, it's talking about all sorts of mitzvot you should do for to help other people, etc. And it mentions there the holidays. Okay, psol lecha. Okay, this is psol lecha luchot. Right? And it's Shmot Lamedal at Aleph Tekavav. And also the holidays are mentioned there. And Vaida Barashama Moshe Lemor, which is Bamid Bartet, which you might remember from Pesachim, which is Pesach Sheni. Perfect thing to talk about in Pesach Rishon. Why don't we mention Pesach Sheni? All these people who couldn't come to the temple in time on Pesach Rishon, they were impure, or they were far away. So that we read also. Yom Tov on Shachag. What about the last day of Pesach? Korin Vayihi B'Shalach. Umaktirin Vayidaber David. Okay, perfect thing to read on the seventh day of Pesach. That was the day that Kriyat Yamsuf, the splitting of the Red Sea, happened. So we read Parshat B'Shalach, which is what we're going to read this Shabbat, about the splitting of the sea. Then we do the Haftorah for Vayidaber David, because that's a song. And Vayidaber David is a song, a song that he sings in Shmuel Bet. So we read that for Haftorah. Ule Machar, what about the second day of Yantif? So the Machal Kol Abachol, which is the same section of Shiva Shavuot, they just call it something different because the section really starts from Kol Abachol, which is in Dvarim Tevav Yud Tet to Tet Zayin Yud Zayin, and Maftirin Baod Hayom. Okay, Od Hayom Benov. Okay, this is a section which talks about um, the the destruction of Sancherev. So some people say, oh, that's that was known to have happened on on Pesach. Some people say it's really because there they make a reference to the getting out of Egypt, so that's why, okay, right, which thank you, Becky, for reminding me that we also say that on, um, on Yom Atzma'ot. It's talking about also the redemption, so it's all connected, this, the, the theme of the redemption, um, which is a very much Pesach theme and also obviously Yom Atzma'ot theme. Okay, so now, um, okay, so that's what we read on Pesach, but it's not exactly what we do, because again, first of all, in, in Israel, you're missing a day. Okay, that's a big mouthful. It sounds like he's saying a, a phrase as a mnemonic device. This is the way to remember it. He has eight things listed here. What he's basically talking about, this is the reading for the eight days of Pesach, and each word is a reference to it. And they kind of go in pairs. Like Meshach Torah is pull the ox. So Meshach is Mishchu. That's what we read on the first day. And this is really our custom comes from Abaye. We read that on the first day. Meshach Torah, Shul, Shor Kesev Oez, Ki That's the beginning of the section in Parshat Emor where all the Chagim are listed. So we read that on day number two. Psol is Psol Lecha, right? That's Shemot Lamedale. Bimidbara is Pesach Sheni. Shlach is, oh, I skipped, sorry. Kadesh Bekas, I think I skipped two, no? Kadesh Kadeh, ah, right. Kadesh is Kadesh Li Kol Bechol. That's the section about in Shmot Yud Gimel, where it says all the all the firstborns are sanctified to me. The section of Tefillin is in there, and that obviously there's all a reference to um, getting out of Egypt. Bekaspa is in Kesef Tel Aveh. Psal is the Psal Chaluchot. Bamidbara is Pesach Sheni. Shlach is Bishalach. 
um, getting out, and Bukhra is Kola Bechol. Okay, so we basically have the eight things, and that's really the readings that we do. There's one issue, which is that gives you eight days. What's the problem? Problem is in two or three more minutes, we're going to say, what do you do on Shabbat Chol Moed? And there's another reading. So then the question is, how does that work in with this? There's actually an overlap between that reading and another. I'm not going to get into all the details, but depending on what day of the week, sometimes Chol Moed is, sometimes Shabbat falls out on the Chag, and there is no Shabbat Chol Moed. That's why you really need eight without Shabbat Chol Moed, because sometimes there is no Shabbat Chol Moed. If there is, then one of them drops, and then it sort of depends on what's what the what day it comes out. Anyway, you can look in a machzor and follow. Okay. Um, moving on. Atzeret. Shiv'a Shavuot u'maftirim b'chavakuk. Okay, this is actually what we do on day number two of Shavuot in Chutz La'aretz. Okay, we don't do this on day number one. But right now in the Brayta, they say, just like they said in the Mishnah, we read the Shiv'a Shavuot, which is a section in Dvarim, which is also later referred to as Kola Bechor, and earlier we just called it, we said it on the seventh day of Pesach as well. And maftirin with chavakuk, Okay, either chapter two or chapter three. It's a debate Ashkenazim Sfardim about this. Achirim omrim. Other people say though, in this Brayta already, a different opinion is mentioned, and this is the one we do. Bechodesh Hashlishi, which is the getting of the Torah. Umaftirim b'merkava. Well, what did we have at Har Sinai? It was this huge revelation of God. When else do we have this revelation of God? The Maseh Merkava, the very famous in Yechezka, where he sees these angels, and right, it's this section that we talked about recently that nobody really fully understands, and yet we read it for the Haftorah. This is where we read it. So according to Acherim, and maybe that's part of the debate here. Maybe not everyone thought you should read it because we don't understand it. Vaha'idna, <coughs> again, here chimes in the Gemara. Okay, that was bright until now. The Gemara chimes in and says, Vaha'idna, nowadays, Ikatreyome, Avdina Ketravayu Ve'ifcha. Now they say, now that we have two days, we do both, but we swap, we swap the order. Why do we swap the order? Because the first day of Shavuot is Bab Sivan, which is the day that, according to most people, was the day that we received the Torah. And therefore, if you're going to already be reading the day about the receiving of the Torah, you may as well read it on the proper day. Okay? In Chutzla, in Israel, we only read that, and we don't even read the, the first one. Okay. Which makes sense, by the way, right? It's seems like a more appropriate Torah reading than talking about something that mentions, you know, count the days till Shavuot, but it's not exactly as central as reading, for, you know, the acceptance of the Torah. Berosh Hashanah b'chodesh ha-shvi'i u'maftirin ha-ben yakir li Some of the Brayta also, it says, not what we do. Read this section in Parshat Emor about in the seventh month. This is right, this is what you bring. And then you do the maftir of ha-ben yakir li What's that about? If you remember, by the way, it's one of the ten psukim of Zichronot, because it says, Zachor as kerenu od, so it appears in our davening on Yom Kippur, and it's the Haftorah, because it talks about God remembering us. Rosh Hashanah is called Yom Hazikaron, so it makes sense. The Yeshomrim, some people say, here comes what we do, Fashem Pakad at Sarah, because it's a tradition that Sarah's prayers were answered on, on Rosh Hashanah. Umaftirim bechana, okay, this is a tradition that both of them Right, their prayers were answered on Rosh Hashanah, so we do the Haftorah of Chana. Both of them were praying for children. Eventually, after many years, were answered. Their prayers were answered. So, perfect thing to talk about on Rosh Hashanah. And now that we have two days, now you would expect them to say what? We do one day Hashem Pakad Tzavah, and one day Ubayom, right? Ubayom Ha That's not what they're going to say. They're actually going to say the custom that we do. Which is, So the Haftorah stays, but the Torah reading switches, and they don't really tell you why, okay, why they switched it, and they got rid of the section from Emor, and they instead put in Akedat Yitzchak. Okay, maybe they just thought it was a much more moving passage than, okay, we have this holiday of Rosh Hashanah. Um... Okay, one thing I want to point out here, something very interesting that you could just sort of pass over, but if you pay attention, so nowadays that we have two days of Rosh Hashanah, what do you mean nowadays? Didn't we always have two days of Rosh Hashanah, right? Didn't we have a whole discussion about that and a whole thing? So the commentaries ask that question. There's answers given, but the question is really actually a pretty good question. I'm not going to get into the answers right now. Next, This is a section from Yeshayahu. This is actually what we read. 
which is a big question, why we read the Arayot, which are all the forbidden relations, the most obvious answer would be to say that it's in the same parsha, Haremot, of the Avodat Yom Kippurim. So maybe because of that they read it, because it's kind of the continuation there. It's a possibility. Some people say it's because the Jews keep the mitzvah very carefully, and because of that they're worthy of getting atonement. All sorts of reasons, I don't know why. Uma, and it's, there's many different reasons given you. The list is long because usually when it's not so clear cut, people come up with different theories. Maftirim bi Yona, we do the maftir of Yona. That's a very more clear connection, right? Where it's about doing tshuva and repenting and changing your ways, etc. Amara bi Yochanan. Okay, now we're going to have a break again. Again, this, again, I just want to keep reminding you, this was one long brighta that we just keep breaking. I want to keep reminding you because it's confusing. If you look at the sheet, Okay, for those who are more new, or maybe you haven't heard this explanation, on the sheet that I, the study guide, I do it in different colors and fonts to show you the difference between the Tanaitic material and this, the comments of the Amora. So I want you to, like, particularly on a page like today, it's very relevant because you'll see what's a quote from the Torah, like what the Torah passage that we're reading, what's a comment of the Brita, and where does the Gemara start interjecting. So it's very obvious if you look at the font colors and the fonts and the colors, you'll see where there's an Amora talking and where it's the Brita. So now we have a total break. Since we mentioned this Haftorah of Yom Kippur in the morning, even though we're already past that because we got to Mincha of Yom Kippur, but now we're going back to the morning Haftorah, they're going to say something about the verse the verse that was quoted here, and they're going to compare it to a verse in the Torah and a verse in the writings as well. So, Amar Rabbi Yochanan, Kol makom sh'ata motze gvurato shal HaKadosh Baruch Hu, ata motze anvatanuto. Everywhere you see the glory of God and how amazing it is, you also see how humble God is. How do you see this? Well, davar zeh katu b'Torah, it's written in the Torah, shanoi b'nevim, it's repeated in the prophets, u'mishulash b'nik b'ktuvim, and it's also tripled in the writing. So it appears in a bunch of different places. Sorry, this is shaking. Okay. Katu b'Torah. Ki Hashem elokechem hu Elohei Elohim v'adonai Adonim. Okay? God is, right? The God of, right? The, the, the most wondrous of all. Ukti batrein. Immediately after it says, Osem mishpat yatom v'amanah. Now, if God is so amazing, high and mighty, why would he be dealing with people who are considered low on the, you know, in terms of um, how would you say it? In terms of importance, if we think of a community, right? We think of the nobles and the you know the people who have high level in society, rather than the people who are unmarried, who lost their husbands, who lost their parents. Right? They're certainly in their society, right? They're considered lower, having lower status in society, and therefore, the what they're saying is God has time for those people as well. Okay, that shows how humble God is. He has no problem associating with anyone of any kind of status, even a lower status. Shanoi b'nevi'im, where do we see this? Exactly from the Haftorah of Yom Kippur. Ko ha-maram b'nisa shochin ab v'kadosh, right? Our prayer, shochin ab marom v'kadosh shemo, comes from here. V'ukti batre, right, which means God is high and mighty. V'ukti batre v'etaka u'shfal ruach, and it says there, eshkon. God will dwell among the low people. Okay, that has not, right? That's not an issue at all for God. Umishulash baktuvim dechtiv solu laroche ba'aravot biyashmo. It's about God riding up in the heavens. And ktiv batre avi yitomim v'dayana manot. He's the father of the orphans and he judges, right? Makes judgments for, right? This isn't judging the widows. It's judgments for the widows to basically help them out. So God is basically both high and mighty, but also humble at the same time. And I assume this is a way of trying to teach the people that you should be the same, right? We all know the problem of leadership and how often it gets to their heads and they no longer have this, this trait of humility and it's saying how important that is. Okay, that was a total segue. Now we're back to the Brayta. Yom Tavrishon Shachag, first day of Sukkot, Korim Parashat HaMoadot Shabbatorat Kohanim, Umaktirim Hinei Yom Bala. Hashem, this is a puzzle from, uh, section from Zechariah where they talk about in the future on Sukkot, the, the other nations are going to come worship God. Um, so perfect one for Sukkot. Vahaidna diikatre yome limachar mikra hachinami karinan. On the second day, we read the same parsha in the Torah, which we already talked about, which we do. Aftu ema maftarina. What's our maftir? Haftorah. Vikalu elamelech shlomo. Okay, now we're going to see. Shlomo, when he dedicates the temple, we're basically going to split it up into three sections. One we're going to read on the first day of Sukkot. First of all, it was, it was known that he did it on Sukkot, and that's why we read it on Sukkot. 
Then there's a section that talks about on the eighth day. So we're going to read that on the eighth day. And then there's another section that we're going to read on the ninth day, which is the right, Simchat Torah in Chutz La'aretz. So we're going to basically be reading three different sections from the dedication of the temple on the holiday of Sukkot. Which I guess makes sense because Sukkot was a very Mikdash-focused holiday. Okay? So therefore... I'm supposed to Pesach, which was Mikdash focused, but really only for the Korban Pesach, not for all the other days. On Sukkot, we have the, the Nisu Hamayim, and we have the Arava, and we have all these other mitzvot that would happen in the temple. So I could see there being a connection between reading all about the dedication of the temple. Okay. And we have the prayer for rain, right? And there's this whole section. Part of what we read on these days is this part about what prayers that Shlomo, first of all, did prayers himself, and then also he talks about what the purpose of the temple is going to be for. It's a place for prayer for people to come to when they need. So this is the beginning of it. So we read that section. This is like the Mishnah. The rest of the days you read the sacrifice for those days. Yom Tova Acharon, Korin Kol Abachor, Mitzvot V'chukim U'Bachor. On the last day, okay, which is in Chutz Laaretz we're talking about, you read Kol Bechor and the Mitzvot and the Chukim and the Bechor. Okay, meaning in the, what does this mean? You read the section Kol Bechor, which is the Shiva Shavuot, it was mentioned before, it's that section in Sefer Dvarim, which includes laws, right, Mitzvot, Chukim, and it includes the laws of Bechor, and Maftirim Vayikichlot Shlomo, when Shlomo finished building. So that's the later part in that same section, which is on the eighth day. Lemachal on the following day, Korin Vezot Abracha Umaftirin Vaya Amod Shlomo. On the next day, you read Vezot Abracha, which is the end of the Torah. This is right. We finished the Torah, and the Maftir, you do Vaya Amod Shlomo, which is another section from there. Okay, what's the issue? We don't do that, by the way, right? What do we do? We read Yehoshua. Okay, we don't read the Torah of Shlomo on the the eighth day, you know, and and the prayers he did. No. We actually read Yoshua because we finish the Torah and then we move on to Yoshua. We also read, by the way, which doesn't mention here, we also read the beginning of the creation of the world, which isn't mentioned here either. Okay? So again, as I said, there's differences of opinion here. Um, I think, is it? Right. So, no, I thought that Tosfot made reference to this. Yeah. Yeah, so Tosfot says it. In Tosfot, where it says, Lamachar Kuin Abazod Abraham, Afturim Vayamod Shlomo, Vyesh Makamot Shnagul Aftir Vayhi Achare Mot Moshe, Vishibushu. He doesn't like it. He says it's a mistake. Shara Tamud Ain Omer Kain. Just look, the Gemara doesn't say it, so it's obviously a mistake. Vyesh Omrim. Some people say, though, Shara Hai Gaon Tikain Lamar Vyi Achare Mot Moshe. Again, going to the, the time of the Gaonim, that he's the one who said it. He says, but I don't know why he changed the, the order of the Talmud. Which is funny because the Tosfot on the previous page basically was saying that there's things different. Right? First of all, Tosfot is a group of people that span 200 years. So the one who wrote that one didn't necessarily write that one and they might not have seen it. So there's two different, right? One is saying, oh, well, this, you know, it doesn't say this, but we do it. And it says it in Mursay to Rav Amram Gaon, even though it's not mentioned in the Gemara. This one is saying, well, it's not mentioned in the Gemara. Why would we do that if it goes against what it says in the Gemara? So anyway, that's, but what's the difference, by the way? The one he mentioned on the previous page that we started with about that we add, this was adding, that we read Maftir on holidays and we say the section about the sacrifices brought. That was in addition to whatever Torah reading. This is against the Torah reading that it says. So that is more difficult for him to understand. Here it actually goes against what the Gemara says. So there, there's actually a difference. Okay, next. Amar Rav Huna Amar Shabbat Shachal Yop Moed. Bein Bepesach Bein Besukot. Okay, now we're going to have Shabbat Chol I told you we'd get back to this. Shabbat Chol Moed on Pesach and Sukkot has its own special reading. Mikra Karina Re'e Ata. Okay, it's a section from Parsha Re'e. Okay, um, one second. It's from Shmot. Oh, sorry. No, it's not Parsha Re'e. Sorry. Re'e Ata is from Shmot Lama Gimel. Okay, um, which talks about coming three times a year to the temple. So what have Torah do you say? Which is right? The, these dry bones that come back to life. And it's a reference to the which in the future is going to happen on Pesach, supposedly. Again, there's, many, there's some other reasons given as well. I'm not going to, um, to go into all the details there, like all the different reasons. Again, these are all things where there's something that exists and then it becomes also, um, you know, 
people give all sorts of theories and connect in all sorts of ways. You know, why the real reason we don't really know. Because again, there's a tradition that that might happen on Sukkot or maybe there's other reasons as well. Okay, um, moving on. So Hanukkah, again, the Nisim brought their gifts for the, the Hanukkah HaMishkan, for the sanctification of the Mishkan. The holiday of Hanukkah is called Hanukkah. It's the same idea about sanctification of the temple. So therefore, we read the, the section of the Nisim that they brought for the Hanukkah HaMishkan. Umaftirim b'nerot is Zechariah. You do the Haftorah in the Nerot of Zechariah. Zechariah had this image of seeing these, these um, about Nerot, Menorah also. So therefore, we read that. Now, sometimes it comes out on two Shabbatot. Now, Zachariah is talking about what's going to happen in the time of the Second Temple. So because this happened in the time of the Second Temple, it's appropriate to be, uh, because the story of Hanukkah happened in Second Temple time period, that's the best one to read. But if it's two, if it ends up two weeks, sometimes Hanukkah starts on Shabbat and ends on Shabbat. Kamaita b'nerot is Zachariah. So the first one we keep is that. But to write to the second one is Nerot Shlomo. Shlomo also talks about, um, about the the menorahs in the temple, okay, the, the, there were all these, um, They remember we talked about that there were 10 menorot, okay, we had things like that, there's psukim about that in Shlomo, so we read that. Okay, so basically, I see people are writing that, about this being a confusing daf, so I will say this is quite confusing, it took me a while to prepare it as well, um, so just so you know, it's not just hard for beginners, it's hard for people even who are experienced. It's, it's a little hard to do this without seeing everything inside of what we're referring to, okay? But again, if you come out of this understanding, a few basic ideas, which are, number one, the Torah readings were not set in stone, right? And what we read from the Torah and what we read from the Torah is something a bit fluid and it changes. And as two days of Yantif became a big thing, so they had to also rethink that. I think if you come out of this with a perspective on how they, you know, a little bit about how they made decisions about these things and why they thought to put these things, which again, the Gemara doesn't exactly give you the reasons, the commentaries talk about it. And again, it's a good example of when there's no specific reason given, it opens up a huge opportunity for everybody to kind of come in and give their opinion, which makes it a little more confusing to learn because you can't just say, okay, this is it and it fits into a box. So this isn't something that exactly fits into a box. And in general, Prayer is like that in general, where if you, re, if you want to, I once taught a class in prayer and it becomes a little difficult because most of the reasons for how these prayers developed were never written down and they were never explained. And therefore it just becomes conjecture. So you read one book and somebody has this theory and you read another book and someone has another theory and it becomes very hard to really break it down and figure out what the reasons are. The best way to really study prayer and this kind of thing is to study how it progressed, what its original was, what the basis, and then what things got added on and what things changed. And so you could sort of do that here as well, where, you know, and you see how things change over time. And again, depending on what affected the change and why people chose certain things. But again, you don't really know. So if you're a little confused, don't feel bad. Sometimes there are dapim that are like that, but, um, you know, it, it, it is quite a confusing daf, but I did try to help you by, if you really, and it's again, if you have extra time to study this daf, the best thing to do would be to open each section in the Torah and read it inside and see what they're talking about, right? That's very helpful. That's why I tried to give you on the sheet. I didn't manage in every single place, but I tried as much as I could to fit in where the verses in the Torah are, okay? So that you can actually do it on your own after. Okay, moving on. Bipurim vayavah malek. Okay, this is a little simpler, right? We talked about the section when Amalek came to attack the Jews because that's, Right, exactly. This was again, you know, the same kind of thing happening again in the Purim story. Again, Purim and Hanukkah, you're stuck because there's nothing in the Torah. So you have to think creatively, how can we connect something in the Torah to this idea? But, right, Purim is a little easier than Hanukkah. Because Hanukkah, really, there wasn't so much of a connection. So they just took, oh, dedication of the temple, dedication of, this, of the sanctuary, of the tabernacle. Let's try to connect that. This is very simple, okay? At least we have an easy one, right? This is the sacrifice they brought on Rosh Chodesh. Rosh Chodesh Shechali Yopah Shabbat. Okay, now we have, I would say, like the cuter things. Since we have references in the Nevi'im to connection between Shabbat and Rosh Chodesh, so if Rosh Chodesh falls on Shabbat, we have a special Haftorah for that Shabbat. Maftirim Vayimidei Chodesh Bechodesho. Okay, it's really Shabbat Shabbato and Chodesh Bechodesho. It talks about Shabbat and Rosh Chodesh together, so we read it on Shabbat Rosh Chodesh. Chaliyah Bechab Shabbat. 
It comes out on Sunday, Rosh Chodesh. You might know this is famous. It's called Machar Chodesh. Okay, Me'et Mo Maftirinan, the day before, which is Shabbat, you do the Aftara called Machar Chodesh, which is the story about David and Yonatan, when Yonatan was trying to help save David. But Yomalo Yonatan Machar Chodesh, she says, tomorrow is going to be Rosh Chodesh, so, oh, very cute, right? Since tomorrow is going to be Rosh Chodesh then, let's read that on the day when tomorrow is going to be Rosh Chodesh. So both those times we stop, we don't read the regular Haftorah for that week, we read specifically this. Amar Rafuna, Rosh Chodesh Av Shechali Yobu Shabbat. Okay, when Rosh Chodesh Av falls on Shabbat, and we do this, the Shabbat before Tisha B'Av, Maftirin Chodshichem Umoadechem San'an Afshi Hayu Alay Latorech. This is what we call Chazon Yeshayahu, it's the first um, chapter of Yeshayahu. We call it Shabbat Chazon, because we read about this this Chazon Yeshayahu, where he talks about all the bad things, and God says, I hated your um, Sanan of I hated your holidays and your Rosh Chodeshim. Hayu Alay Latorech, they were a burden to me. So again, stop the Brighton for a minute to try to understand this. My Hayu Alay Latorech, why was it a burden? Amar Kadosh Baruch we actually saw this sugi already before in Shas. Amar Kadosh Baruch Hu, Lo Dayan and L'Israel, Shechotin L'Fanai, Ela Shemachachachim Oti Leda, Ezog Zeha Kasha Avialehem. Not only are you sinning, but now I have to work harder because I have to come up with what punishment am I going to give you, right? Anyone who's a parent or a teacher knows, right? This is really a problem. Your kids misbehave. It, it becomes your headache, right? Not just their headache. It becomes your headache as well. You have to decide how are you going to punish them, right? If they just behave, life is nice and it's easy and, you know, simple. But as soon as something goes out of whack, right, you have to figure out, oh, how am I going to punish them? You have all these decisions to make. So that's a burden, as we know. Someone said before, what about Tisha B'av? So, Again, the now here, the Brayta didn't talk about this either. The Gemara comes in and says, "What do you read? On, what's half Torah do you say on Tisha B'av? Interesting, they don't ask what Torah reading. In a minute, we're going to get to that. You would have expected Torah reading to come first. Amarav Echa Hitalizona, which is also from Yeshayahu. It's in the first chapter. It's just later in that chapter. Bit of a debate which pasuk we start from. But this one is pasuk Kaf Aleph. Whether we start from there or the pasuk before, difference of opinion, but. Says we do that. Mikra mai. Okay, we actually don't do that. Have Torah. Okay, we'll get to that soon. What do we read from the Torah on Tisha B'av? Tanya. We're gonna have a brighter now. We're we're done with that original brighter. Now we're quoting a different brighter that gives three opinions. Achirim omrim. They start with achirim. Im lotish meuli. That's the curses. Okay, these are from. Uh, just check right. These are the curses from Vayikra. Okay, the curses in at the end of Vayikra in Bechukotai. Um, this is from the spies. Remember, the spies, according to tradition, happened on Tisha B'av. So we're going to read about the sin of the spies. Which is also about the spies, but it's the part where they get punished. The punishment and not the sin. So difference of opinion here. But Abaye comes in and says, we don't do any of these. nahug alma lemikre kitoli banim. Which is a section in Parshat in Sefer uh, Dvarim, also Parshat Dvarim, in the beginning, chapter four, where it says, kind of predicting what's going to be that you're going to leave God and sin and get punished as a result. Umaftirin asof asifem. Okay, and then the Haftorah is this section in Yirmiyahu where Yirmiyahu basically is mikonein. You know, he laments the destruction, which is appropriate for Tisha B'av. B'ma'amadot b'ma'aseh b'reshit. Here we have a repeat sugi of something we saw in Tanit. So, Minani, Mile, why do we read in the Mamadot? Remember the Mamadot? Those were people who came to the temple or to their local shuls to pray for the sacrifices to be accepted. So, why do we read from Asebre? Reshit? Am Rabbi Ami, Ilmale, Mamadot, Lonit Kaimu, Shamayim, Ba'aretz. If it weren't for people praying about the sacrifices, we wouldn't have the world. Okay? And that's why we read about the creation of the world. How do we get this? Shanema? Im Lobriti, Yomabalai, Lechukot, Shamayim, Ba'aretz, Losamti. If it weren't for the covenant that we have, there's a Pasuk in Yumiao, then the world wouldn't be exist. Now we're going to see what's this covenant. The covenant is that you bring Korbanot and I will forgive you. Okay? That's the covenant. And because of that, Korbanot, this is what keeps the world going. So how do we know this? Um, Avram turns to God and said, how do I know that I'm going to, that I'm going to have people who are going to inherit me? Here's the story behind that pasuk. He said to God, He looked in history and said, Hey, look, people sinned, you destroyed them. How do you know? How do I know that my people are going to continue forever and you won't destroy them? Amar lo lab. He says, No, 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 that won't happen. Amar le fanav, Ribonoshalam, ba me eda. Avram says, I want a sign. Amar lo kali agla He says, Do the brip in aptalim, right, which is this very strange tekes. 
according to this explanation, it's a reference to sacrifices, right? He took these animals, he split them in half. I won't get into all the details, but Amar Lefanav. So basically, before we get to the next line, God says sacrifices. That's going to be your solution. So Avram says to him, right, as if Avram saw into the future, he says, So I understand when there'll be a temple and we can bring sacrifices, that's great. What if there isn't? Right? You'll read about the sacrifices, and then it's as if you did the sacrifices. Okay, so this whole thing was coming to teach you. It's the sacrifices that keep the world going and that keep the Jews going. So that's why they read about Masebereshit. So now, why can't we stop in the middle of an aliyah with the klalot? Minani, Mile, where do we get it from? Two different answers. Don't, don't, don't hate my, my musr. When I tell you, you know, to behave, don't get upset. So if you stop in the middle, it looks like you're hating what, what you're reading. We don't want you to make a bracha on the Torah. It's as if you're blessing the bad things, as if you want them to come true. So they say, So what should you do? Especially according to Rish Lakish. So you can't stop in the middle, but you stop at the end, and then you make a bracha. It's also like making a bracha on the bad. Tana, so the Brayta says, You read a pasuk before and a pasuk after, which you already know means not really a pasuk, because you can't read one pasuk of a section. So you read a few pasukim before, a few pasukim after, and then you do the blessing. Amar Abai, Lo shanu ela bekalot shebetorat kohanim. Abai is now going to distinguish and say this is only true in the Vayikra ones. Aval kalot shebemishneh Torah, the ones in Tvarim, posek, you can stop in the middle. We don't do this. But he says you can. My time, halalu belashon rabim amurot umoshe mipi agvura amaran. Falalu belashon yachid amurot umoshe mipi atzmo amaran. The ones in Vayikra are plural. The ones in Tvarim are singular. The ones in Vayikra are said by God and the ones in Tvarim are said by Moshe. So the ones by Moshe were less serious than the ones that are communal and said by God. Levi Barbuti, here's a story to prove this. Have a kare, become a gam game, come to Rav Huna Barure. He started fumbling because it was a very long aliyah. It was hard for him. So, Amarlo, Achinaf Sheikh, Rav Huna said to him, Don't worry about it. You can stop here because you're in the middle of Tvarim ones. There we said you can stop. So, you could take a break in the middle of your lane. Okay, Tanya. This actually is true. We make sure that before Shavuot, we've read the Klalot of Yikra, right? The Torah readings always fall out this way. And before Rosh Hashanah, we read the ones in Tvarim. To which the Gemara says, and We want to finish the year Okay, with the curses, like get the curses done before the end of the year. So they say, end of the year, what does that have to do with anything? Because Devarim before Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Hashanah is the beginning of the new year. Is that Seret Rosh Hashanah? No, Shavuot is not Rosh Hashanah. Well, if you learn Mesechet Rosh Hashanah, you will remember this maybe. It is considered the beginning of a new year. For the trees, that's why we have Bikurim, the first fruits. So there is some element of it. Okay, now we're going to get off on something else. Tanya, totally non sequitur. Because Rabbi Shem Ben Lazar was quoted, we're going to quote a different bright of his. Rabbi Shem Ben Lazar Omer, Im yirmu lechaz kenecha stol, v'yeladim b'nei. If elders tell you, elderly people tell you to break something, and the children, younger people tell you to build something, store v'al tivnei. Even though normally better to build than to break, listen to the elderly people because... Very powerful line, right? When Zkenim tell you to destroy something, it's actually to improve on it. And it's actually for a good reason. And when, when children tell you to build something, it's not always for a good reason. And Siman Ladavar, I see you wrote this in the chat, Rechavan Ben Shlomo, that he listened to the young people and not the elderly people. And because of the elders, because of that, he ended up having the, the kingdom split. Okay, last thing for today, this very interesting debate. What he's basically saying is, when you finish your laning in the morning on Shabbat, Mincha picks up from there. Wherever you finish there, 
Shani, Monday, you pick up from where you stop. Thursday, you pick up from where you stopped on Monday. And Shabbat, you pick up from where you stopped on Thursday. Very different approach to what we do. That's Rabbi Meir. Rabbi Yehuda, Meir, Makom Shemav Sikim B'Shabbat Shacharit, Sham Korim B'Mincha U'B'Sheni U'V'Chamishi U'Le Shabbat Haba'a. He says, like we do, no. Whatever you ended, Shabbat Shacharit, that's where you read all the rest of the readings. Amar Rabbi Zeira, the halacha is, Makom Shemav Sikim B'Shabbat Shacharit, Sham Korim B'Mincha U'B'Sheni U'V'Chamishi U'Le Shabbat Haba'a. He paskins like we do, right? We paskin like him, really, which is, you like Rabbi Yehuda. So the Gemara asks, Why didn't you simply say the halachas like Rabbi Yehuda? Answer, Mishum Because people switch Rabbi Meir and Rabbi Yehuda and then they wouldn't know who you meant. So he wanted to make it very clear how we hold and that's what we do. Stop here for today. As we'll finish this Masechah, you'll have to wait a few days on Sunday together at the Seum. And looking forward to seeing you all there. Registration is open on the website. Have a great day, everybody.